Still more bodies on Earth this afternoon, Terry, from the home of a Northwest suburban contractor. In the annals of criminal history, there are names that evoke both terror and fascination. One such name is that of John Wayne Gacy. While his outward persona might have appeared to be that of an average community member, beneath the surface lay a chilling darkness that would shock the world. Join us as we delve into the disturbing story of a man who concealed his true nature behind a facade of normalcy. As investigators delved deeper into Gacy's life, they uncovered a trail of darkness, a series of sinister secrets that would shatter the illusion of normalcy forever. Join us as we journey into the heart of a complex and disturbing case, seeking to understand the mind of a killer while paying tribute to the memory of those whose lives were forever changed. Prepare to journey into the chilling depths of the John Wayne Gacy Jr. case, as we explore the haunting legacy of a man who will forever be remembered as more than just a name. Welcome to Insight Wave, the channel that delves into both solved and unsolved cases from around the world. If you haven't already, please take a moment to like and subscribe to stay up to date with the latest crime stories delivered straight to your inbox. Born as the second of three children to John Wayne Gacy Sr., a machinist, and Marion Elaine Robinson, young Gacy's life took an unexpected turn. The Cook County records hold a secret, a mother's name noted as Marion Eve Robertson. Amidst a blend of Polish and Danish heritage, Gacy's family life was anything but ordinary. A troubled relationship with his father, marked by alcoholism and abuse, left scars that ran deep. Yet, amidst the darkness, his sisters and mother provided solace, affectionately dubbing him, Johnny. A twist of fate arrived when Gacy was struck by a swing at the age of eleven, leaving a hidden trauma in his brain. Unbeknownst to him, this injury would shape his future, leading to blackouts and a medical intervention at sixteen. Navigating through four high schools, Gacy's journey was one of instability. Dropping out before completing his senior year, he embarked on a journey westward, leaving behind a shattered family. From the glittering lights of Las Vegas to the halls of Northwestern Business College, Gacy's path was unpredictable. Amidst his journey, a management trainee role beckoned from the Nunbush Shoe Company. A new chapter unfolded as he met Marlon Myers, a co-worker who would become his wife. Springfield, Illinois, became a backdrop for newfound ambitions, with Gacy's involvement in local organizations painting a facade of community involvement. A twist of fate arrived as Marlin's family extended an offer, a managerial role in a Waterloo, Iowa KFC. Gacy's life veered once more, the shadows growing longer as he left Springfield behind. After relocating and settling in Waterloo, Gacy's life took on new dimensions. With a son and daughter in tow, he dedicated himself to his KFC franchise, yet his insatiable drive led him back to the JCs. As rumors of his hidden sexuality swirled, Gacy's dual life remained hidden, earning him the title of outstanding vice president within the JCs. But beneath the surface of this community involvement lay a dark underbelly. The JC world in Waterloo was tainted by vice, prostitution, pornography, and drugs. Gacy was no stranger to these secrets, diving headfirst into this world. As he strayed from his wife, he embarked on a dangerous path, luring young boys into his basement club where alcohol flowed and sinister intentions unfolded. The idyllic life Gacy had constructed in Waterloo began to crumble in March 1968 when accusations emerged. Two boys, just 16 and 15 years old, came forward, accusing Gacy of unspeakable acts. Professing innocence, he fought against the allegations, but desperation drove him to orchestrate a violent attack on one of the accusers. The truth unraveled, and Gacy's dark secrets were exposed. In a swift turn of events, he was arrested, tried, and convicted of sodomy, sentenced to a decade behind bars at the Iowa State Penitentiary. Amidst the chaos, his wife sought solace in divorce, forever severing ties with Gacy. His incarceration became a bleak period marked by isolation and loss, his father's death from cirrhosis on Christmas Day 1969 and the abandonment of his children. After serving 18 months, Gacy was paroled in 1971 and moved back to Chicago. 
After finding refuge in his mother's home, Gacy's story took a new turn. He went to work as a construction contractor and then started his own construction business. That July he remarried a recently divorced woman he had met through mutual friends and, with financial assistance from his mother, moved into 8213 West Somerdale Avenue in Des Plaines. This seemingly ordinary house would become a site of unimaginable horror. But as the facade of normalcy held, a series of disturbing incidents began to surface. In 1971, a disorderly conduct charge was filed against Gacy, alleging he attempted to coerce a young boy into sexual acts. Despite the complaint being dropped, the darkness of his actions continued to spread. With his parole ended in October 1971, Gacy seemed to escape his past. However, his disturbing behavior persisted. In 1972, he faced another arrest after being accused of battery. Again, charges were dropped, allowing his sinister path to remain concealed. In a peculiar turn of events, Gacy entered into marriage with Carol Hoff in June 1972, a woman from his teenage years. Their relationship held secrets, as did the house on Somerdale Avenue. Gacy's construction company, PDM Contractors, emerged, masking the twisted layers that lay beneath. As his marriage deteriorated, Gacy's dark proclivities emerged. The walls of the Somerdale Avenue house became a witness to a shattered sex life, late nights out, and disturbing materials left out in the open. By 1976, the Gacy's marriage had dissolved, further exposing the cracks in his facade. Amidst the darkness, Gacy maneuvered his way into the local Democratic Party, cultivating a public image that starkly contrasted his hidden life. His involvement in the community grew, allowing him to cross paths with First Lady Rosalind Carter during the Polish Constitution Day Parade. A seemingly innocuous photo would later prove a startling revelation. In the sweltering July of 1975, a distressing event unfolded, plunging John Wayne Gacy further into the depths of infamy. Among his employees, John Butkovich, vanished without a trace. Tensions had flared as Butkovich departed Gacy's employment due to a dispute over unpaid wages. As worried parents raised concerns and pleaded with the authorities to scrutinize Gacy, but nothing came of it and the young man's disappearance went unsolved. In December 1976, Gregory Godzik, a fellow employee under Gacy's employ, vanished into thin air. Desperation set in as his concerned parents implored the authorities to scrutinize Gacy, one of the last people known to have spoken to the boy. Astonishingly, the police chose not to pursue Gacy's potential involvement nor uncover his hidden criminal past, allowing the sinister puzzle pieces to remain scattered and concealed. As the year turned to January 1977, the shadows of Gacy's world deepened with the disappearance of John Sick. Linked by association to Butkovich, Godzik, and Gacy, Sick's absence cast an unsettling pall over their intertwined lives. Later that same year, the tendrils of intrigue tightened further when one of Gacy's employees faced arrest for stealing gasoline from a station. Curiously, the car involved had belonged to Sick. Gacy's account that Sick had allegedly sold the car to him before vanishing went unchecked, as the authorities opted not to delve deeper into this eerie connection, leaving an ominous thread dangling in the tapestry of Gacy's story. Growing tired of the grim chore of digging holes in his claustrophobic crawlspace, Gacy's thirst for readily available space took a sinister turn. He enlisted the services of one of his own employees, David Cram, to create more room for his twisted desires. This chilling transformation coincided with Cram taking up residence in a spare bedroom within Gacy's house. A night of terror etched itself into Cram's memory as he returned home after work. The house's eerie ambience was further amplified by Gacy's intoxicated state and his unsettling choice of attire, an eerie clown costume. What followed was a nightmarish sequence of events, as Gacy lured Cram into a trap. Intoxication gave way to a macabre display, with Gacy's growls of malevolence accompanied by the sound of spinning and chilling screams, I'm going to rape you. However, in an act of incredible courage, Cram managed to overpower Gacy, toppling him to the ground. Amidst the chaos, 
he miraculously secured the key to his handcuffs, seizing the opportunity to escape the clutches of impending horror. Cram's harrowing encounter marked a turning point, offering a glimpse into the darkness that pervaded Gacy's home, a darkness that would soon come crashing down on a much larger scale. Luckily, some more of Gacy's victims survived. In March of 1978, Gacy enticed Jeffrey Rignall into his car. Employing chloroform, Gacy incapacitated the young man, transported him to the Somerdale house, subjected him to rape and torture, and eventually abandoned him in Lincoln Park. Despite the initial challenges faced by law enforcement, Rignall managed to recall specific details from that fateful night, even amidst the effects of chloroform. These details included the presence of a black Oldsmobile, their route along the Kennedy Expressway, and various side streets. Rignall decided to conduct surveillance at the expressway exit, patiently waiting until he spotted the distinctive black Oldsmobile. Following it to 8213 West Somerdale, he provided the crucial information that led to the issuance of a warrant and Gacy's subsequent arrest on July 15. Remarkably, Gacy was already in the midst of a trial for the battery charges related to the Rignall incident when he faced additional arrests in December, this time for the other murders. It's worth noting that in December 1977, a 19-year-old man had lodged a complaint, alleging that Gacy had kidnapped him at gunpoint and forced him into engaging in sexual acts. Nevertheless, once again, the Chicago police chose not to take any action. On December 11, 1978, Robert Piast, a 15-year-old boy, mysteriously disappeared from the Des Plaines pharmacy where he worked part-time after school. Moments before his disappearance, Piast confided in a fellow co-worker, mentioning that he intended to visit a house nearby to speak with some contractor regarding a potential job opportunity. It's worth noting that Gacy had been present at the pharmacy that same evening, engaged in discussions about a remodeling project with the store's owner. However, when contacted by Des Plaines police the following day, Gacy denied any interaction with Piast. Unlike the previous experiences with Chicago police, the Des Plaines police took proactive measures and conducted a thorough background check on Gacy, revealing his prior conviction for sodomy. Upon conducting a search of Gacy's residence on December 13, investigators uncovered a range of suspicious items, including a 1975 high school class ring, various driver's licenses not belonging to Gacy, handcuffs, a 2x4 with drilled holes at its ends, a syringe, clothing that appeared to be too small for Gacy, and a receipt from the pharmacy where Piast had been employed. Additionally, detectives detected an unsettling and offensive odor emanating from the crawlspace beneath the house. As the investigation continued, it brought to light the disappearance of Godzik. The origin of the high school ring led them to sick, and through Gacy's second wife, they were made aware of Butkovich. On December 21, 1978, a revelation surfaced when one of Gacy's employees confided in the police, disclosing that Gacy had confessed to being responsible for over 30 murders. Shortly after this revelation, Gacy was apprehended on charges related to marijuana possession. Subsequently, the police obtained a second warrant, returning to the Somerdale residence, where they made a grim discovery of human bones concealed in the crawlspace. Upon learning that he would now be charged with murder, Gacy admitted to committing approximately 25 to 30 murders. During his confession to investigators, he revealed that the majority of the victims had been buried in the crawlspace beneath his property. When the crawlspace became too full, he resorted to disposing of the last five bodies, including that of Piast, by tossing them off the I-55 bridge into the Des Plaines River. Gacy even went as far as drawing a diagram of his crawlspace to assist the police in locating the specific burial sites. Gacy informed the police that his modus operandi involved approaching male teenage runaways or male prostitutes on the streets and enticing them to accompany him back to his residence. This persuasion often involved promises of money for sexual favors, although in some cases, he resorted to using force to subdue them. It's worth noting that at least one of his victims was picked up at a bus station. Once inside his house, Gacy would restrain them, typically using handcuffs or other means. 
To stifle their cries for help, he frequently placed clothing in their mouths. Following this, he would sexually assault them while choking them with either a rope or a board. Shockingly, Gacy admitted to keeping the bodies with him for as long as the process of decomposition would allow. The police had previously conducted searches at the house, primarily focusing on the crawlspace, but their efforts didn't stop there. Over the next four months, a haunting and macabre procession of human remains continued to surface from the property. This grim spectacle unfolded in full view of reporters, television news crews, and astonished spectators. Ultimately, between December 1978 and March 1979, a total of 29 bodies were unearthed from Gacy's crawlspace and the surrounding areas. Among these victims, the youngest identified were Samuel Stapleton and Michael Marino, both merely 14 years old, while the oldest identified victims were Russell Nelson and James Matsara, both 21 years old. Tragically, eight of the victims had decomposed to such an extent that they could never be positively identified. It wasn't until April 9 that Robert Pius's remains were discovered on the banks of the Des Plaines River. The trial of John Wayne Gacy, which began on February 6, 1980, featured a harrowing presentation of evidence against him. Prosecutors summoned family members of Gacy's victims, including those identified among the 33 victims. Emotional scenes unfolded as a mother fainted upon seeing her son's bracelet, a grim reminder of his murder. Witnesses, including Gacy's employees, shed light on his sexual advances, instructions to excavate his crawl space, and his chilling, rope trick, confession. State exhibits, like the flooring and trapdoor to the crawl space, remained in the courtroom throughout the trial. Gacy's defense argued that he was mentally ill and should not be held criminally responsible for his actions. A surprising defense witness, Jeffrey Rignall, a survivor of one of Gacy's attacks, recounted his traumatic experience, aiming to bolster the defense's argument of mental incapacity. The prosecution countered with expert testimony, diagnosing Gacy with a personality disorder but disputing temporary insanity. After passionate closing statements, the jury delivered guilty verdicts on March 12, 1980, making Gacy the man convicted of the most murders in U.S. history at the time. The next day, after deliberation, Gacy was sentenced to death, and he spent over a decade on death row before being executed in May 1994.